All right. Um, so today I will be giving my talk on street drugs, what's out there, and just how bad is it? Just want to start off by saying I have no conflicts of interest related to this talk on drugs of abuse. And so the objectives of my talks will be to examine the current drug problem here in the United States, to understand novel drugs of abuse, new designer drugs, what are they, how they work on the human body, where you can find them, how they're regulated by the federal and state governments. Briefly discuss the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic is really its own discussion, its own talk, uh, but I will briefly talk about it at the end. And then what are the providers in San Francisco? What are we at UCSF? What are we at the California Poison Control System doing about what uh, is happening with drugs of abuse problem here? What we won't be talking about today are drugs that you have heard about maybe in the media, uh, on TV, things like heroin, marijuana, ecstasy, cocaine. And it says, my, my title here says, out with the old, question mark. It, the drugs are still very much there. It's just that my talk today will focus on newer, newer drugs that are out there. So the drugs that I just mentioned, methamphetamine, cocaine, ecstasy, they're still very much out there. In fact, a, in a survey uh, by the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in 2013, we see that 24.6 million Americans age 12 and above use an illicit drug in the past month. That's a lot of Americans. That's 9.4% of the population, and that's up from 2002. That's up almost nine, eight to 9% 9 from 2002. And so we see that the drug problem is still rising. And this translates to $600 billion annually in costs related to crime, health care, and lost work productivity. And you'll see here, now this is a bar chart showing the total number of overdose deaths in the United States from 2002 to 2015. So again, you'll see here that drug abuse is still a very big problem. The numbers are rising. And this, by the way, is collected by the CDC, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Well, there's some good news, maybe. Right, there's some good news that mo the use of most drugs has stabilized or declined in the past decade. With the exception of methamphetamines, not quite sure why that is, and also with the exception uh, of marijuana. Now that's probably because of the most recent, recent legislation, marijuana. But all in all, drug use has stabilized or declined for the most part. So what am I gonna talk about today if I'm not going to talk about those drugs that you've heard about before? I'm going to talk about some of these things here. I want to be talking about over there K2. That's another word for synthetic cannabinoids. I'm going to be talking about bath salts. What are they? How they affect the body? And then something here that maybe you may or may have heard about. This pill down here is called kratom. So we'll get into it. Novel drugs of abuse. What are they? Why are they novel? So another name for novel drugs of abuse are designer drugs. They're also called research chemicals, legal highs. Uh, these, are some of the, these are some of the descriptors of novel drugs of abuse. And what these new drugs are are really structural or functional analogs of a controlled substance. So they look a lot like the structure of methamphetamine. If you compare their organic structure to the structure of, let's say, ketamine, they look similar, but they're not quite the same. And what they, are, what they were designed for is to really mimic the pharmacologic effects of the original drug. Mimic, but maybe have more um, potent effects. So why was there even a shift? Why wasn't the world just satisfied with methamphetamine and cocaine and heroin? And, you know, why create these new drugs? Who did that? So it started out really um, from a good place, I think. Uh, what happened was that academic chemists and pharmaceutical scientists were studying maybe benefits and therapeutic uses of the drugs that we know about. Marijuana is a really great example. How did synthetic 
cannabinoids come to exist, where it was really trying to figure out how we how to create a drug that acted like marijuana, but maybe had beneficial or therapeutic effects. And then at some point, when these new drugs were created, they were taken and they were taken and then brought to the drug market. But really, uh, it seems like they came from a good place. So why, again, another reason why there's a shift from the older drugs to the newer novel agents are that they're pretty easy to access. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about where to even get them. Now, I talked about how these drugs were called legal highs. The way they're marketed is, um, is very interesting, right? They're marketed with things that say, not for human consumption. So that helps them bypass, helps them bypass some of the regulations that puts them on the shelf. So by ease of access, I mean they're really, they're, they're readily available on the internet, they're readily available in head shops. Even here in San Francisco, you'll find some, you know, in the Haight, or um, I've definitely walked some, by some in the downtown San Francisco, so that they are out there. Users are using these drugs because they're, they're alternatives to older and better characterized drugs of abuse. There's something new. It's ex new and exciting, um, sometimes even cheaper than the older drugs. And another reason for why there is even this shift and why people are choosing to use these new novel agents are that they avoid detection in standard drug screens. So the urine drugs of abuse screens that we use in our hospitals in the emergency department where I work can't detect a lot of these drugs. There are special laboratory tests that need to be performed to actually detect and confirm that the patient was actually taking a new novel agent. Dr. Wu, who spoke a couple weeks ago, spoke about these new analytical te uh, technologies. So what's the problem? The problem is what I mentioned just before, something like this. On, right on the package, it says not for human consumption. Uh, so again, this is just it brings home the point that they're they're out there, and they have, and some of these drugs have really bypassed the regulations to put them on the shelf. And another problem is that okay, I told you that they are functional analogs of a drug that we already know about, but the problem is that they they their mechanism of actions are actually very different, and I'll go through a couple of examples uh, in the next coming slides. They're also difficult to track. We talk about how they're not easily detected in the standard urine drug screens. Another reason why they're difficult to track is because, uh, what I mean by that is that they're constantly being made in these clandestine laboratories. Um, one is created, and then it's the public knows about it, the government knows about it, then another one's created, and it's it's almost like a chase. We're chasing them. We're trying to figure out what's going to come next. We don't know. We're going to start with talking about synthetic cannabinoids and what those are. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell you about a story you probably heard about in the media. It's this. So on July 12, 2016, the New York uh, EMS was dispatched to an incident in Brooklyn, New York. And they reported that there were multiple people on the scene. And bystanders, had, bystanders told the media that everyone had just a very weird al altered mentation. And everyone looked very, very zombie-like. There were a total, subsequent media uh, reported 33 persons were involved. Now, the index patient was a 28-year-old man who had come into the emergency department. And it was described that he just had a blank stare. And he had zombie-like movements. Nine hours after his arrival, he said that he inhaled a substance that was in a packet, and something that he'd never used before. And what that was, was this, AK-47. And it was in this packet, and you'll see some of these herbs on the bottom left there. Now, this substance and the blood and urine samples of eight patients were analyzed and found positive for a synthetic cannabinoid. So what, is, what was the substance that was detected in all of these patients? The culprit was this, AMB Fubinaca. Now what is that? I will, I will tell you. Um, but first, just briefly on what synthetic cannabinoids are, and we'll go back to what AMB Fubinaca is. So the synthetic cannabinoids are known as synthetic marijuana, which in the coming slides I will tell you is a misnomer. 
It's also referred to as spice, herbal incense. You may have heard of K2, potpourri. Sometimes the back of the package says it's for potpourri. And what they are inert herbs with the chemical added. Usually the chemical is sprayed or the herb is soaked in the chemical. And there are many, many available varieties and forms. As you can see in this picture here, different packages, they all might contain different types of synthetic cannabinoids. And they're all packaged in these very colorful, uh, appealing, appealing um, aluminum, aluminum baggies. So the question is, are synthetic cannabinoids actually synthetic marijuana? What is the connection here? So I'd have to talk about marijuana just for a bit before I tell you about synthetic cannabinoids. Now, marijuana, when taken, acts on two different receptors in the body. We call them CB1 and CB2. Now, you see that there are CB1 receptors in the body. They are in the brain. And when marijuana gets into our system, there are some constituents of the marijuana that binds to the CB1 receptor and causes the psychoactive effects that people know of marijuana. There are other constituents in marijuana that act on a CB2 receptor, and those receptors are in the periphery of our body. And those are responsible for some of the more immunomodulating effects, like for the control of nausea, let's say. And so CB1 and CB2 are actually where synthetic cannabinoids act as well. They act on the same receptors as marijuana. But the problem with synthetic cannabinoids is that there's an increased affinity for the receptors. They bind more tightly, they bind for longer duration, and so while synthetic cannabinoid users, users can have some of the similar effects of marijuana, such as, um, such as euphoria and altered mood, um, other, some studies have shown that they have very, very detrimental effects, effects that persons with using marijuana wouldn't get, things like seizures and cardiac arrest. Now, these are things that are not reported with regular marijuana use. Um, and so that's, how, that's, how, that's where the connection is. They act on the same receptors, just one acts in a way that we're not exactly sure about, but we know that they're just stronger, bind stronger and longer. Now, I'm not going to show you a ton of structures in my talk, but I think this also this is also a point I'd like to make that it really is not marijuana. Synthetic cannabinoids are not marijuana. To the left here, you'll see THC structure. To the right here, you'll see two different types of synthetic cannabinoids. One is called JWH018, and the one below that is that one that was responsible for the zombie light states of those persons in Brooklyn, AMB Fubinaca. Now, initially, in the early 2000s, the synthetic cannabinoids that were made in the labs were named after the people who created them. So JWH018 was created by John W. Huffman in Hoff, Huffman, Huffman, John W. Huffman in, at Clemson University. AMB Fubinaca, now, now the nomenclature has changed. Uh, you can't name, the, the synthetic cannabinoids are no longer named after the people who created them. They're now named after the organic chemistry structure. So Fubinaca really stands for fluorobenzyl indazole carbonyl. So that's where that comes from. The point here is that they're structurally very different. And in this, in this slide, it's kind of small here, and the point I wanted to make in this slide is that there are a lot out there. They keep changing. What do you have to do? You just take a structure and you add a group here, you add a methyl group, a ketone here, or something else here, and you create a totally different structure. I mean, the possibilities are really endless. And, there are, and JWH018 is not really seen anymore. There's newer, newer synthetic cannabinoids being created and used every year. So it's not marijuana. Uh, a, study in, um, a, study sh a study showed us that these synthetic cannabinoids are actually several times as potent uh, than THC, and some of the newer ones are actually 700 times more potent than marijuana. So they're very, very strong, right? This is just another graph of data collected by the National Poison Data System. And what we see here is from January 2015 to April 2015, there was an increase of 330% of the use of synthetic cannabinoids. They're out there and they're being used. And so this just 
this just means that this is definitely a public health threat. Synthetic cannabinoids are something that's out there and they're gonna to continue to be out there for a while. Some of the unexpected effects that I was talking about earlier with these are that they're seizures, something that we wouldn't expect just with marijuana, chronic lung injuries. There was even a report of ischemic stroke after use of synthetic cannabinoid. In a study published by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, there was an outbreak of acute kidney injury associated with synthetic cannabinoid use. 16 patients in six different states reported uh, kidney injury one to six days after use of the synthetic cannabinoid. And five of those patients required hemodialysis, so very severe kidney failure related to the use of a synthetic cannabinoid. And it was just one particular synthetic cannabinoid. We can't predict what the next synthetic cannabinoid is going to do to the body. It's just they're all so different, and they're all so different in their chemical structures. And so the point is that there's so many out there, and we just can't keep up. We can't keep up with how many um, are out there. In 2012, um, the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act uh, was enacted by the Obama administration to put canna cannabimimetic agents as Schedule One. Now, Schedule One really is is um, really the highest level of of um, regulation for for drugs of abuse. And so, it can, so many molecules were put into Schedule One. Now, with synthetic cannabinoids, at this time, 15 are Schedule One. 15. There's way more out there. There's over 150, even more, that has been reported to the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime. And so, what, what's what's going on? Why can't we make all of them sub Schedule One? Why can't we make all of them illegal? Well, it's not that easy um, because they're so. It's kind of like a chase. Right, you make one illegal, another one gets created. You make another one, and and so it's almost it's it's, it's a chase that that we're that um, that that's happening at the federal level. Now there is a federal analog act that states that any substance which is structurally similar to a Schedule One agent can be a Schedule One as well. So, okay, so can you say all synthetic cannabinoids are illegal? Well, no. Um, the problem is that in each instance, uh, the similarity needs to be demonstrated in a court of law. And so that takes a while to happen. And so you'll see that every couple of years, the DEA puts another two or three into Schedule One, maybe another two next year, another two the next year after that. But again, there are hundreds out there. And again, this is what I've showed you before, but there's just so many different, and the molecular structures just, are just evolving. So what do we do about it? What do, we, what do we do about it? The federal government is doing what they can about it. Um, now, some states have enacted their own laws to try to prohibit some of these synthetic cannabinoids. For example, in 2015, a law passed in Texas prohibited more than 1,000 potential synthetic cannabinoids. And that's good, um, and that's creative. You know, 1,000 is still a very finite number, however, and so as we saw, the number of potential synthetic cannabinoids is just growing, and so maybe it's time to think about new innovative approaches uh, to, to, to combating this problem, but the fact is that right now, it's still very much a problem, and it's still a public health threat. I'm gonna move on and tell you about a different story, and it's this one that you may have heard about. This, was, this happened in May, 2012, um, a naked male, Rudy Eugene, attacked and gruesomely maimed a homeless man underneath a tram bridge. And upon admission to the hospital, the man on the right there um, was missing his left eye and about 75 to 80% of his face above was, uh, was missing. And the autopsy revealed no human flesh in Eugene's stomach and, but there were some undigested pills, and there was a lot of speculation that these pills may have been bath salts. And that's where I first heard about bath salts. I'm like, oh man, it was that man that ate the other man's face, bath salts, what is this? Uh, police have yet to confirm if those pills were bath salts. This was just media speculation. Uh, but this was my segue into telling you about bath salts. So am I talking about this? These are the nice smelling ones. This is a picture I found on Etsy. No, it's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about synthetic cathinones. This is another, this is the, this is a name for bath salts, synthetic cathinones. So what are they? Synthetic cathinones were derived from the cot plant that you'll see here on the right. Now this plant, uh, the genus and species of this plant is called Catha edulis. It's native to East Africa, where the indigenous, pe indigenous people there have been chewing the fresh leaves for hundreds of years. Um, and cathinone is the main active, psychoactive ingredient in this cot plant, and it produces a stimulant effect. Uh, resulting in increased alertness, energy, increased libido, appetite suppression, euphoria. And the WHO, though, does not consider COT to be a seriously addicting drug of abuse, but chewing the agent has been linked to peptic ulcers, heart attacks, and deaths. So synthetic cathinones were developed in the 1920s for, synthetic per for uh, therapeutic purposes. And so what they are is they took the substance that was in the cot plant and they synthesized it in the lab. And it was widespread, widespread use in Europe in the early 1990s, and then it spread to the U.S. And then currently at least 30 chemical compounds in existence, and there's many street names. And they're kind of small over here, but you can see they're called uh, bath salts, meow meow, MCAT, ivory, wave bubbles, vanilla sky, cloud nine, white lightning. So lots of different names for these things that we, uh, that at least I heard about were just called bath salts in the media. So in 1993, cathinones were classified as schedule one by the DEA. And the Drug Abuse and Prevention Act of 2012 made several cathinones controlled substances, but it's the same story as I told you about synthetic cannabinoids. More are being created. Some are being added as scheduled one, and then more are being created. And so every couple of years, some more synthetic, uh, synthetic cathinones are being added to the schedule one list. But again, it's still, a ch it's still that chase that I was talking about. Um, again, like synthetic cannabinoids, these cathinones are sold in smoke shops, head shops, gas stations, as bath salts. They're sometimes called plant food. They're sometimes labeled as jewelry cleaner, research chemicals, etc. But again, this also, this just is another point about how they're pretty easily accessible if you know where to find them. They look like methamphetamine, not too different. Over here on the left side, you'll see methamphetamine. To the top right there, you'll see the basic cathinone structure. There's a ketone group there for your, your chemists um, that double double bond with an O. There's a ketone group, so that's the only that's that's the only difference there. So below that, there are two different cathinones that I've just put as examples. One is methcathinone, and the other mephedrone, and they all act the same way. You're saying, well, it looks like methamphetamine. Does it act like methamphetamine? Well, it sure does, and um, it creates uh, it causes increase in the levels of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine in the body to create those stimulating effects. Again, there are structural variations, and so and cathinones are more hydrophilic in their nature, and so they're able to cross the blood-brain barrier more readily than their than than their amphetamine counterparts. So. And again, the again like synthetic cannabinoids, where we can't really predict what they're going to do. Same thing with synthetic cathinones. It depends, really. The mechanism of action depends on the duration of use, um, the dosing, and the timing onset. Um, the timing onset really varies with the mode of administration as well. Whether it's smoked, whether it's um, uh, insufflated, whether it's used intravenously. Again, the same story with synthetic cannabinoids is that we can't we can't really predict what they do. And so you'll see here in a report by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention in Michigan from 2010 to 2011, you'll see that patients presented to the emergency department with bath salts had a variety of symptoms, anywhere from agitation, which was the most common uh, uh, which is the most common presenting sign, uh, all the way to seizures, hypertension, drowsiness, paranoia. These patients, some were treated in the emergency department, some had to be admitted overnight, and then one person uh, was dead on arrival. Other reports document muscle injury, severe, severe muscle injury, and cardiac arrest. Now, I don't want to scare you too much about cathinones. Um, I think this is a good point to... Good, good, uh, 
this is a good time for me to tell you that there are some therapeutic cathinones out there. Um, so this is, the, again, on the left is a basic cathinone structure. On the top right there is a medication called bupropion. It's also known as Welbutrin. It is actually a great medication for smoking cessation and for depression. The drug under there, diethylpropion, is an appetite suppressant. And so these are both in therapeutic use. They just happen to share the same structure as some of the other synthetic, more potent cathinones. What's being done about the cathinones? Why well, I briefly mentioned that it's still, it's still the chase. Maybe we need to think of new, innovative approaches to this ever-growing problem. I'm going to shift gears here and talk about, a little bit about hallucinogens and psychedelics. And I don't think any lecture would be complete without mentioning this person right here. Anyone know? Yeah. Well, this kind of, um, this uh, inventor of something similar to LSD, I would say. So this is Alexander Sasha Shulgin. Um, and you'll see his birth and death dates here. Now, he authored a book called PyCal. It's, the, it's an acronym for Phenethylamines I Have Known and Loved. And he authored this book in 1991 with his wife and extensively describes their work and personal experiences with this class of drugs, phenethylamines. And due to his extensive work in the field, I mean, the book was basically a cookbook of how to make them and also what is, you know, what he and his wife experienced after using them. Um, he was dubbed the godfather of psychedelics. In 1994, a couple of years after this book was published, the DEA raided his lab, and they requested that he turn over his DEA license. And uh, so many of the notable substances that are mentioned in the book are actually now Schedule One. But this is where it started. And I, I'm presenting to you a quote from the book here, and you can just, I'll, I'll just read it aloud to you. This is an excerpt from the book here. How long will this last, this delicious feeling of being alive, of having penetrated the veil which hides beauty and the wonders of celestial vistas? It doesn't matter, as there can be nothing but gratitude for even a glimpse of what exists for those who can become open to it. The book, I have not read the entirety of the book, uh, but it is available. So if you're interested, it sounds something like this. Uh, so we're going to talk about phenethylamines. I'm going to tell you a story that one of my colleagues actually wrote about in the medical literature, a paper, and it took place here in Burning Man, which is an annual gathering that takes place in Black Rock City, Nevada. It's actually a temporary city that's erected for the purposes of, you know, experimenting in art and music and self-expression and things like that. It actually used to take place here in San Francisco in Baker Beach. Um, I, so that's what I learned about Burning Man not been myself. So the case that was reported was of a 24-year-old woman who was found to have very fast heart rate. She was breathing really fast. She had an agitated delirium. And she was drinking wine. She said she was smoking marijuana. And she used three blotter papers of what she thought were LSD. And when she was brought to the medical tent at Burning Man, she thought she was being attacked by invisible assailants, and she was very, very, very agitated, screaming, um, you know, something that you wouldn't expect as mu so much with uh, three blotter papers of LSD, which she said she had taken before. So she recovered after 10 hours of supportive treatments. She received some medications. She received some medications to kind of cal help calm her down. She received some, she received some fluids, um, and she got better. So what did she take? She took something known as NBOME, also known as NBOM. And these are designer phenethylamines. You'll see on the top left here is the basic phenethylamine backbone. Now, what Alexander Shulgin created and what are still being created in laboratories are designer phenethylamines. These are substituted phenethylamines. Now, the structure on the bottom is actually, is actually just the structure on the top with a whole bunch of different things added to it. Right. You'll see a ring added to it. You'll see a bromine group there, a couple of methoxy groups there. Those are, those are the oxygens with the, the CH3 there on the side. But designer phenethylamines are also extremely hallucinogenic. 
And so they may be marketed as legal LSD, and it's often sold on blotter papers as well. They act on the serotonin receptors in their body, and that's how they create their hallucinogenic effects. Um, and they have increased affinity for the receptors compared to amphetamine. And so it's the same story as synthetic cannabinoids and synthetic cathinones, where they have increased affinities for the receptors compared to the original, the original drug. And the effects and the duration of action of this NBOME really depends on the compound and the route. And so the list goes on and on and on. The list of drugs that are out there just goes on. I personally am constantly learning about new drugs. What are you using? You know, what, what, you know we'll, we'll ask our patients. You know, they're, they're just getting, they're getting drugs off the street or off the internet, and I'm learning from my patients. Here are some other ones that you'll see. Uh, the first one is 5-methoxydiisopropyltryptamine, also known on the streets as foxymethoxy. The one on the left here is tryptamine. Now, tryptamine is a naturally occurring uh, neurotransmitter or, or protein that's found in plants or even in the mammalian uh, body. Now, what, what uh, chemists have done is created a designer uh, tryptamine here on the right to that. Again, it's the same structure. It just has a couple of other constituents added on there. On the bottom there, you'll, th you'll see methoxetamine. It's an analog of ketamine. Now, ketamine, also a drug of abuse, but it can also be used therapeutically as well. This is a, this is a medication that we use in the emergency department, at least, uh, sometimes. On the left, you'll see ketamine. On the right, you'll see a drug of abuse called methoxetamine. Again, similar structures, but synthesized in the lab, adding a couple of constituents on there and creates a more potent drug uh, and some with very undesired effects. Here's another one, kratom. Now, kratom is derived from the Metragena speciosa tree. This tree is native to Southeast Asia and the the alkaloid, or the plant protein that comes from the leaves are called metragenine. And metragenine has stimulant-like effects at lower doses, and at higher doses has opiate-like effects. So it can be very dangerous in that way. It can cause uh, depressed mental status or coma, and can also cause decreased uh, respiratory rate and can slow and even stop your breathing. And these can be bought as pills. No, these can be bought as tea leaves to be brewed. These can uh, also be bought as uh, compound pills here and are readily found on the internet. The big picture here is that drugs are constantly evolving. And the reality is that labs are making new and dangerous synthetic drugs faster than we can ban them. So where, do you, where can you even get them? We talked about head shops in the city. We talked about the internet. But where on the internet? Can I just like Google and find them? Maybe. Um, but the, the dark net is something, is, is, is where a lot of our patients are getting new drugs. New drugs that we really don't even have in the books. You know, they're, they're being created in, uh, in China and other parts of Asia, Russia is where some of these drugs come from, and they're being sold on this hidden part of the internet, this dark corner of the internet called the dark net. And it's where individuals can enact, uh, interact anonymously online. And it's often accessed using encryption mechanisms, and so very difficult to track. Um, and then the websites can actually host servers on in hidden locations, so again, very difficult to track. But the dark net, this, this hidden corner of the internet, really provides an area where there are a variety of illegal substances and services and communications can be made. Patients or people, excuse me, people can use cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to access, to, to buy some of these things. And so again, uh, we're constantly learning from our patients. The common themes here are that drugs are constantly evolving, which I've already said, but that there's no antidote. There aren't antidotes for synthetic cannabinoids. There aren't antidotes for synthetic cathinones. There aren't antidotes for NBOME or those psychedelic uh, the psychedelic um, phenethylamines. Um, so when patients present to us in the hospital, good supportive care. We support them. We make sure they're not so agitated that they're not injuring themselves or other people. If they're dehydrated, we treat their dehydration. If their electrolytes are too low or too high, we treat those. But really, it's just about good supportive care until the drug wears off. I'm going to switch gears here. 
but, and talk about the opioid epidemic. Um, because I don't think that a talk that a talk that includes other street drugs uh, would be complete without discussing some of the street drugs that are involved in the opioid epidemic. And so I'm going to tell you about a couple of stories that we at the Poison Control Center have uh, encountered in the last couple of years. At the end of 2015, we saw an outbreak of fake Xanax hitting the streets. A colleague of mine was working at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, where two patients presented with very, very severe um, respiratory depression. And, and it's odd, because these patients thought they were taking Xanax, which will cause one to be tired. And the, 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 the two patients that presented said, you know, we've used this before. Uh, we've never been, we've never passed out for a whole night from the use of Xanax before. You know, what, what's going on? In fact, the third person in this case uh, was found dead in the morning. The three had to use it together and one of their friends didn't wake up in the morning. Said, this is really odd. How, why is this happening? And so my colleague, you know, we put the California Poison Control Center on alert. And subsequent to that, we had a number of phone calls in the subsequent weeks of other people who had presented to emergency departments with unexpected effects from taking Xanax. And what we found was that, well, there was fake Xanax out there. And they looked very similar. You'll see that the real Xanax is on the left, the fake Xanax on the right. And the people who had been creating this fake Xanax had been using fentanyl as a substitute. There was some Xanax in there, and then there was some fentanyl in there. And we'll talk about what that is. But it's a very strong opioid medication. It's giving them these effects. In another case, in last year, in 2016, we saw, well, there was no more Xanax out there, and now there was counterfeit Norco. Now, Norco is a painkiller that has acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and an opioid called hydrocodone in it. And it can be used if taken, if taken as prescribed uh, for, as a painkiller. And so there was people who had presented to hospitals who were very, 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 very somnolent and who had also had respiratory depression after taking what they thought was Norco. They're like, I've taken Norco before, and this is not Norco to me. And over the course of a couple of weeks, we at the San Francisco Division of the Poison Control Center had about, um, I believe we had seven to 10 cases. In Sacramento County, though, they had 53 overdoses and 12 deaths related to counterfeit Norco. In the pictures here, you'll see that they look very much the same. You'll see the top here is a pharmaceutical tablet. The bottom tablet there is the fake one. You can't tell. Patients, people, people who are making these were buying pill presses off the internet. And then sometime in 2016, in September, we also saw this story where people were dying and overdosing because their heroin was laced with not fentanyl, like what we saw in the fake Xanax and the fake Norco. They were laced with car fentanyl, now an analog of fentanyl that is even more potent than fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is, you'll see here, the DEA issued a warning, says that uh, the car fentanyl is actually 10,000 times more potent than morphine and 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And so very, very dangerous. Eight people died in the Midwest. So it's a huge problem. I think these three stories, and there are numerous other stories out there that just really underscore the opioid problem here in the United States. Now, what are opioids? Here are a couple that I've just named, not a, not a comprehensive list. We see heroin, morphine, hydrocodone, oxycontin, oxycodone, and methadone. These are all different types of opioids. Um, and now, some now some of these that you may you may be taking they're they're medications that are analgesics right and sometimes they are really good for pain um, but they can cause euphoria as well in severe overdoses can cause mental status depression like lethargy and coma and can also cause respiratory depression meaning slowing of the respiratory rate to where a person will just stop breathing and that happened with some of the deaths the opioid epidemic starts, the story starts in the early 1990s where opioid use expanded. 
And so why, why this happened were three, three, three reasons. Um, an increase in the number of prescriptions that were written and dispensed. Around that time, physicians were taught that pain it was a fifth vital sign. It was very important to treat, right? You would treat a person who was febrile, right? You would treat a person who had too high or too low a blood pressure. You treat someone whose heart rate was too high or too low. Well, physicians were taught that you would treat someone if their pain level was too, too high. That's what you have to do. And a way to treat that would be to give someone a really strong painkiller. There's a greater social acceptability for using these opioids for different purposes. Well, if you had some back pain, if you had a back strain, you would get an opioid to treat it. If you had a wrist sprain, you would get an opioid. Sure, if you had a, bone, a broken bone, that may be warranted, but it was almost too easy to get them at some point. And there was also, at the same time, aggressive marketing by pharmaceutical companies to push, push newly created drugs. Something like OxyContin was really, really popular uh, by and, and pushed by, um, you may have heard the story of like Purdue Pharmaceuticals really pushing that drug in the early 1990s and thought to have contributed at least in some part to the to this epidemic. Here you'll see uh, you see a graph released by the CDC, and you'll see drug overdose death. Now I told you in the beginning of the talk that drug most drug drugs uh, drug use has stabilized or declined, but not the use of opioids. Now that most of the reason why we still see an increase in the number of drug overdose deaths is because of this opioid epidemic. A lot of those deaths are due to opioids. And you'll see it so much here. Now, drug overdose deaths involving opioids, at that solid line on the top, you'll see it's just continuing to rise. It is just going up. From 2004 to 2013, we can see that drug abuse, particularly drug abuse using opioids, has risen above that of firearm, deaths by firearms and deaths by motor vehicle accidents. So drug abuse is a huge, huge, huge problem. And some of this is related to, and, and a lot of this actually is related to the current opioid epidemic. So what are we doing about it? I've mentioned in, in the talk today what the federal government and what some of the state governments are doing, but what about at the local level? What are we doing? Well, we've, re we've realized that there really is a treatment gap here. So patients are really not getting the help that they need. Um, in 2013, an estimated 22.7 million Americans, that's 8.6%, needed treatment for a problem related to drugs or alcohol but only 0.9% received treatment at a specialty facility. And I think the, I think the mentality is changing, right? At, at some point we thought that, well, gosh, this, people need to stop asking for these drugs. Like, oh, the, there's a stigma related to addiction, right? And now we're it was the it's shifting, the, it, the, the thought is shifting to the point that addiction is actually a disease like much like high blood pressure. Gosh, this person has a disease, we need to treat them. And so hopefully these numbers will improve in the coming years. Some of the things are being done. The American Medical Association has deemed, well, they've released a statement saying that pain is not a fifth vital sign. This, is, this should not be something that's incorporated into your medical practice. Naloxone is an antidote for opioid use. It's an antidote for someone who stopped breathing, can, kind of, can reverse that. And so starting in 2015, pharmacies across California were making naloxone available without prescription. And so Californians can actually purchase naloxone directly from a participating local pharmacist, either using cash or in some cases with private insurance. And the, the caveat is that pharmacists who wish to dispense naloxone need to undergo a special training course, and patients who are given naloxone will need to have a small talking to, brief in training, a brief in-store training about its use. But otherwise, this is something that's being done at at least the California state level. The California Healthcare Foundation has called on physicians in the Bay Area to start treating those with opioid withdrawals and opioid dependence. Now, up until now, much of the treatment of patients has been done at the outpatient setting with their primary doctors, with pain specialists. And ERs were kind of, we were just, as an ER physician, you know, we were just told to, well, stop prescribing so much. Okay. 
you know, what, but, but now that it's become such a problem, now that we've recognized that, well, opioid addiction is really a disease, we should be starting to treat it at every level. And so the California Healthcare Foundation is funding many of the emergency departments here in our city and the surrounding Bay Area to start treating those patients. Um, at the California Poison Control, where where I work along with Dr. Replinger and some of the colleagues that some of my colleagues that you've heard speak in the last couple of weeks, um, we have a partnership with the clinical laboratory at Zuckerberg San Francisco General with Dr. Alan Wu, who you heard speak a couple weeks ago. We communicate directly with the Department of Public Health. We communicate directly with physicians in hospitals, and we communicate sometimes with the medical examiner's office regarding deaths. And all of us work together to try to um, you know, educate one another. We, if we at the Poison Control Center are getting a couple of cases of just, hey, this is really weird. These patients said they were ingesting Xanax, but they're not, they're not really uh, experiencing effects related to Xanax. We're concerned about something else. Well, then we notify the Department of Public Health, who releases a statement, a, a public health statement to get the word out. We work with our laboratory to test some of these substances to confirm um, adulterated products. We talk to the physicians at the hospital treating the patients. And so it's a really a coordinated effort to try to to try to combat what we can here in the Bay, in, in, in California. So hopefully I've given you a sense of kind of what's out there and what we're doing about it. Um, some, of the, some of the topics in my talk could be full lectures on, on their own. We, I can talk about an hour about synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic cathinones or about the opioid epidemic. So this is much of a, this is a well, kind of a brief overview, but hopefully I've enlightened you a little bit. And so with that, I thank you, and I will open the floor for questions. So you're asking, so the question is, what is all of this drug abuse costing to our society? Yeah. Well, uh, I mentioned one of the statistics that I put in one of my slides is that at least for the United States, it's costing us $600 billion annually in terms of lost work productivity, in terms of crime um, and the like. And so it's costing, as far as, as far as I know, it's just costing the U U.S. a lot of money. In 2012, um, the... Uh, was it 2012? It might have been just last year or the year prior to that where the Obama administration pledged to put $1 billion, $1 billion to help combat the opioid epidemic. This is like something that the government has deemed to, that was worth putting money into because in the long run, it's going to actually decrease costs. And so um, a, lo a lot, $600 billion per year. Um, the question is, how are patients who have opioid withdrawal and dependence being treated in the emergency department? Okay, so that's that's a great question. So here at the here at UCSF and at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General, what we've instituted this year is a protocol by which we screen we're screening patients for opioid dependence and withdrawal, and we're treating them with a medication that you may or may not have heard of. It's called buprenorphine, um, also known as Suboxone. It's a medication that provides patients with. Uh, with just enough opioid effect so that they don't go into withdrawal, but doesn't provide them with the effect of like extreme euphoria or CNS or mental status depression or respiratory depression. It's a really good drug to kind of treat withdrawal. And so in conjunction with the California Healthcare Foundation, just a couple months ago, we started this, this protocol. Um, many of the ERs in our city are actually doing it as well. And so it involves really a two-step process, screening, which is what we need to do. We need to educate providers that, hey, this is a big problem. This is something that you should ask any patient who comes to the emergency department, screen them well, and also offer them treatment. We also have partnerships with outpatient facilities, which we also refer patients to as well. So the question is, that what is the difference between treatment with this medication that I mentioned called buprenorphine versus methadone. <clears throat> Buprenorphine is a great drug because it is a it acts partially at the opioid receptors in the body. So like I said, it's just enough to combat the withdrawal symptoms that patients would feel if they would cut their opioid 
use cold turkey, but it doesn't provide it doesn't provide their their uh, mental status depression and respiratory depression. Now, methadone is a full agonist at the receptor, so we got to be careful. That's something that is can patients can actually overdose from. The difference between the two is that methadone for patients who are getting methadone, they must go to a methadone clinic and get their get it every day. And this is really good for some people, right? Some people need that. Some people need to go to a methadone clinic every day to get their drug. Some are very much less reliable than others. Buprenorphine, on the other hand, is more for someone who doesn't need that, someone who is reliable, someone who is really, and, and this is going to be based on the outpatient clinic assessment. Like, is this someone that I can give a prescription to and have them come back in a month and have, have it re being reassessed? Buprenorphine is a medication that does not have to be given in person every day. And so now the question is that, is this a medication that patients can get off of opioids faster with? The answer is no. It is a, in, opioid addiction is a disease, just much like high blood pressure is. Patients with high blood pressure have to take a pill every day for a really long time. Maybe with exercise and great food intake, the medication can be weaned off at some point. Again, buprenorphine or methadone have to be taken every day. It's like, it's a, it's a disease. And so maybe at some point down the line, maybe years down the line, a person can be weaned off of it. But at, for most, but for the most part, it's something that's taken chronically for a while. How much would it cost? How much does it cost to get a, to go outside, to go out to one of these head shops and get a pack of synthetic? Oh yeah. It's probably around $10 average. Some, some are 20. That's what I've heard. I haven't gone for myself, but one I, for one of the packets. So the question is, first of all, how much does a packet of the synthetic cannabinoids cost? So one of those foil packets can cost anywhere from like 10 to $20. Um, and then how much does a person take every time? Uh, do you take a whole foil packet at each time with the bath salts that come in a little container? Do you take the, do patients take the entirety of the, the thing that, at one time? <clears throat> the answer is no. And I've only, I only know this because I talk to my patients. I ask them how they take it. Um, in one in one bag of the synthetic cannabinoid, um, there actually is quite a bit of herb in there with substance. And so, if you can imagine rolling up in a joint, uh, you can't really fit that that much in there. So there are multiple doses that can be taken in one pack. Um, the same thing with the bath salts, multiple doses. And so it actually is quite cheap, right? If you're thinking about it, if it's ten or twenty dollars, you can have multiple doses and multiple multiple times to get high, it's not, it comes out to, it's pretty cheap. It's pretty cheap. It's cheaper than a bottle of wine. Okay. It is cheaper than a bottle, a good bottle of wine. Yeah. The question is, are there certain people out there who are more, in, in my experience, are more vulnerable to addiction? That's a hard question to answer because, um, because I, th because there's, I think there's a lot of patients who coming through the ER who are probably have addictions who we just don't do a good job screening. So, and what I mean by that is some people come in and they're, you know, they have track marks and they're, they're, you know, a, a lot of our patients who are drug abusers are like marginally housed, for example. And so you can kind of, uh, yeah, we, we know that we know it's easy to identify the patients who we think who are drug abusers because we've like seen them. They, they tell us, they're, they're open, open about it. It's those other patients that actually look like you and I, like they, they're, they're well-to-do lawyers and even some doctors. You know, there's a, there, there's, there's a cohort of patients that we just need to be better at screening. And so I think it's those patients that it's hard to tell. I can't really answer that question because I really feel that there is a group of patients that we're just not getting um, when we, when we see them in the emergency department. It comes back to what we're doing. What we're doing is really we're trying to educate our providers to screen everybody. Don't make these assumptions that this is a drug abuser and this isn't a drug abuser just by the way they look or act because it's just too hard to tell. Are we seeing that, the question is, are we seeing uh, that people are getting more addicted to these types of drugs as these drugs evolve? Well, I don't think we know. These are there are drugs that I just found out about, or people are just telling us out. There's there's medical journals that are just releasing like, hey, this is this is a new drug. Watch out for it. I just don't think that they've been around long enough where we can make those kinds of assessments. 
and they're constantly changing. I think it's just so hard to tell. Like once someone, once we find that someone's been addicted or tolerant to a drug, well, we stop talking about it because there's a new one out there. Um, so I, I really just don't think that they're around long enough where we can kind of determine the addictive potential of one particular drug. That's why people use these drugs. That's a one of that's one of the reasons why people use these drugs because they're not detected in standard urine drug screens. The drug screens, for, like in the workplace setting, you know, when you're about to get a job as like a muni driver, you get a drug drugs abuse screen. It's not going to be detected on that. Even in the military, it's not. It really requires specialized analytical chemistry technology to, to do it. At the general at San, at Zuckerberg San Francisco, we have a lab that's willing to do that for us at the poison control center but for the most part yeah it's it, there's too many different ones out there and there's not cross reactivity in the in the test so that it shows up so the question is what are my thoughts on the on what the DEA is currently doing with the situation it seems like making a couple of them illegal every couple of years is maybe not the greatest use of resources because it's it's um, it's a never ending chase and so what is my what are my thoughts on maybe even legalizing these things or how to combat the problem um, i thought you know i when i was making this lecture i thought someone was going to ask me that um, and so you know cuz it's a it's a great question and i i researched about it and I was like, well, what is, what is actually being done? What are states doing? Well, the way, you know, I talked a little bit about how Texas was trying to, you know, they, they, they created a law to say like, maybe these 1000 potential ones are illegal. Um, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer for that, for that question. Should they just be, well, and I don't know if I actually agree with the fact that they should be legalized either. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a very puzzling problem that I think some people have maybe thought about longer than I have. Is there a physiological reaction in the body that caused addiction to these newer drugs? Oh, absolutely. I do believe that, absolutely. People are getting, there, there is like, there is physiological addiction, but there's also like psycho, psychological addiction, right? People, psychological addiction, they crave the euphoria, they crave, for whatever reason, they're taking their drugs to get, you know, to, um, to, to you know, run away from their problems, whatever, it's causing them to have a, to get out of reality for a little bit. But there's also that other kind of physiological craving that people do get after chronic use, right? Of any, of any drug, you use like heroin for long enough, your body starts to go into withdrawal, you know, uh, not even methamphetamine. There's not really a, there's not really a, a withdrawal syndrome related to methamphetamine, but there are withdrawal, you know, people do get, um, you know, like their heart rate beats a little bit faster when they get into these types of withdrawal or they start getting sweaty. Um, absolutely. I, I think they, 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 it is very, I, I don't know the studies on the withdrawal syndromes related to the use of synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic cathinones, but I would imagine that they, because they're, they share such a molecular structure with the drugs that we already know well, that do cause withdrawal syndromes. I imagine that they, they do as well. All right, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you very much.